Hi everyone, the audience today, thank you for participating in um, the Track C option. Um, and today's, this current panel is about how to fundraise from angel investors and venture capitalists, right? So it's an, an hour session. And for the panelists here today, uh, the audience are first time entrepreneurs, business owners, entrepreneurs as well, looking for uh, raising funds and also perhaps understanding more of the business landscape. Okay, so I'll just start off, um, you know, you can do a round of introduction. Uh, you know, could you just share more about what you do on the day to day in your organization? Uh, Michelle, so uh, maybe I'll start off with Michelle, yeah? So, so Michelle, just for, for the audience here today, Michelle is actually leading ecosystems development and social impact catalyst. And uh, she's also a senior associate at Quest Ventures, a leading fund in Asia, right? Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Um, I would also introduce myself. Thanks for the short introduction. I'm Michelle from Social Impact Catalyst. So my day job involves being in part of a venture capital firm. So at Social Impact Catalyst, I work with the executive team led by Tianyi and Jaredine to support young entrepreneurs in social enterprises through design thinking programs and building an ecosystem for impact driven entrepreneurship. So that's for Social Impact Catalyst. In Quest Ventures, my day job, I do venture capital for startup investment, ecosystem building for local and locally and globally to provide an environment suitable for startups, and also developing and executing um, accelerators to build capabilities. So that happens in Vietnam, in Malaysia, and also Kazakhstan. So that's something that I do, yeah, day to day. Thanks, Jerem, back to you. All right, all right, we'll move on to Hui Tie. So Hui Tie is a serial entrepreneur. She is actually the founder and executive director of Vision Group. And he has you know, extensive business experience. He's, he's been on board of three listed companies, listed his own company on the Australian stock exchange for over 300 Singapore dollars at the age of 30 years old, before the age of 30 years old. So that's, wow, we really want the youngest executive director of a London listed company as well. So Hui Tie, would like to share more of your day-to-day, -day, what do you do? Uh, you may also add some more pointers if you'd like to share more about what you do at Vision Group. Yeah, so I would say that uh, at Vision Group, we focus a lot on future tech, primary technologies that will mature within the next uh, three to six years. And uh, today we're looking very much around the areas of data, specifically uh, blockchain for data trust, AI for data clarity, and uh, cybersecurity very much for peace of mind. So I guess from a day-to-day -day, uh, basis as a founder, uh, very much it encompass almost everything. But to summarize it down, it's really about charting the direction identifying what's the right thing to do at the right time, at the right place, and really bring in the key strategic resources, like forming up the key talents and team, obviously raising the necessary funds to make sure that we are well fueled for our next growth uh, and, and drive to our milestone. Great. Thanks, sweet. Yeah. Right. Next, we have Weiming. Right. Weiming is a partner and head of investments and, and of digital and sustainability at Nonny Hill Capital. Right. We may also manage the family office back at VC, uh, P Investments under MAS, uh, investing in deep tech, disrupting uh, many, many industries, including sustainable infrastructures, uh, also relations to telecommunications, aerospace, space tech, even. Wow. So we make such huge, uh, you know, nice profile and, and experience you have that would like to share more about your day to day operations or some more about yourself. Probably you'll take me another more minute to talk about myself. <laughs> I yeah. believe maybe yeah. more than a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I actually, um, I'm also an entrepreneur actually, uh, because uh, I'm on uh, my own business. So uh, when I was a kid, I was a caddy, and I was a waiter. And when I gone into my young adults, uh, when I was studying, I was also doing delivery man, and. Um, and I went into my study in the comm science, and then uh, thereafter I became an engineer. I was uh, an IBM engineer when I first started, and then I became uh, uh, pretty much uh, a John Hewlett Packard uh, in the 90s, and I became uh, one of their team members uh, helping government, Singapore government transform. At that time, it was really about uh, information transformation, e-government. So I was actually part of the e-government team from a uh, technology company perspective. So I used to uh, bring uh, PermSec, bring uh, the head of uh, IDA to Silicon Valley in the 90s. Uh, I've uh, learned how Singapore government transformed. I've seen through 
the whole cycle. And then I went into um, uh, joining the American uh, HQ in Sun Microsystem, uh, helping them develop commercialization in Java. This company called Sun Microsystem. So maybe uh, if you went into computer science uh, universities, uh, you would uh, had learned what is Java programming. So um, I was part of the uh, uh, team to develop the Java, uh, trying to help uh, industry develop and advocate as well as adopt Java. So, uh, and then I gone into cloud computing. Uh, I was actually a pioneer in VMware, this company. So after a while uh, in the corporate world, uh, I always had a entrepreneurial thing in mind, wanting to do something uh, different. So I reinvented myself from a corporate executive into an entrepreneur. So I took up, uh, I relearned what is finance, I relearned what is capital market, uh, and I'm coming from a tech company, and I, I used to run uh, all these businesses, helping companies transform from traditional way into you know, perhaps the most efficient way of uh, running their organization. So I think I thought of bringing this and I started then uh, this fund and now here I am, I'm a venture capitalist uh, and uh, we invested into uh, pretty much globally all this disruptive technology. So uh, we are one of the early investors of Elon Musk. So we invested in SpaceX, Tesla. We are also one of the early investors in Alibaba. So we invested in Jack Ma. So um, the company had, could be in Singapore, but we've been investing globally. And uh, my job, day-to-day -day job, is to find who is the next Elon Musk and uh, Jack Ma over the world and uh, helping them, mentoring them, not just giving them the capital, but also bringing what uh, we need to help them build as a company uh, forward. Uh, so based on my experience from the corporate world, uh, we work together and that's what uh, my job keeping me uh, going every day. Wow, really inspirational. Many of the great entrepreneurs all have a really good support and mentor like yourself and your team, right? So well, we, we, we have, we've heard so much about you know, the panelists themselves, uh, what they do day to day. And I think for the audience here today, uh, as you know, entrepreneurs trying to raise funds, I think one of the key concerns would be what exactly are their investment mandates, right? So, you know, we have Hui Jie who also do the investing, Michelle and Raymond, both are leading funds. And perhaps you could share more about what are your investment mandates? Uh, anyone will take the floor first. Maybe for, for me to start off with? Yeah. So, you know, to me, at the end of the day is how do we look at this entrepreneur? How serious is this entrepreneur? And uh, like what minister has said, I think we are all living in the intellectual world. I think it's not about IQ, it's about EQ. And this is where we see that to help invest into a bold, courageous, as well as somebody that believes that they can make a difference. Uh, this is not about technology. Yes, technology leads to innovation, leads to transformation, but at the end of the day, it's still the human thing. And how we think to invest is to build a group of human beings coming together, looking at how to transform uh, the world using technology from an innovation point of view, to disrupt and make it better so that this whole disruption can help to create more benefit to the whole world. And uh, this is the mandate that I carry on the daily basis to invest on. Great. Really an like ecosystem support and really sector agnostics or any kind of industries as long as we have great founders running them, yeah? Thank Absolutely. You, right. So perhaps Sweetie or Michelle, who would like to share more about investment mandates next? Yeah, so from a vision group perspective, <laughs> uh, our mandates are slightly different. We, are, we come very much for, more from a strategic corporate investment perspective. So our mandate is very much narrowed towards uh, what's strategic towards uh, our current business, either from a go-to-market distribution model or very much from a strong technology standpoint that is very much suited towards our technology stack or blueprint. 
uh, we have participated in about four different uh, investments over the last uh, 12 months. We are currently working on two more, which we hope to close up over the next uh, six months. Um, it's pretty much 50-50, one 50% um, very much focused on a go-to-market to open up specific uh, markets that um, assist our current so-called growth plan. And the other is very much more on strong technology suites. Great. I think because that's really complementary business and, and how can you best add value to the companies you're supporting uh, that complements your work at Vision Group and your leveraging on your strength in technology. Uh, Michelle, we'd like to share more of the investment mandates at Quest Ventures. Sure, I will share more about like Quest Ventures investment mandate. I think similar to Wiming and Huitia, right? We are we are very focused on the founders and also like the go to market. So we invest in very early stage startups in the seed and Series A space. So digital economy is our investment mandate. So that spreads across a lot of different sectors, including fintech, ad tech, um, I think supply chain, logistics, e commerce as well. So. For the current fund that we do have, fund two is Asia Focus and fund three is Maritime Focus. We have about 90 plus portfolio companies right now and they operate in over 150 cities. And we are also like a partner of Startup SG Founder Grant from Enterprise Singapore to support first time founders with pre-seed funding of um, 50,000, not very big, but it's, allow, it's to allow them to set up the company and grow to a certain stage to raise some funding with the help of um, Quest Ventures, of course. Great, thanks, Michelle. And of course, many of the early stage investments in Carousel, Shopback, et cetera, these are notable brands from Singapore to the world. Um, right, and, and I think now it's really, you know, understanding investment mandate is something an entrepreneur needs to know. Also, you know, as an entrepreneur, right, I'll be curious, what would these investors look out for when they want to invest or when I pitch the business to them? So, panelists, you know, what, what, what do you look out for when founders pitch their business to you? Perhaps, uh, Hui Jie, do you want to start off first? Yeah, I guess from founders, it's very much their passion in the things that they do and how much they believe in it. Yet, at the same time, having that balance of what is executable and what's realistic in being able to execute. So many a time, uh, certain founders are super so-called energetic and, and of likes and think their product are best in the world. But the other aspect of being able to go to the market to validate their product, to make sure that people are looking at very much uh, at so-called the same value as what they have very much in their head. So I think founders that very much have a strong passion for what they do, yet at the same time is able to dream and at the same time bring themselves be grounded to focus on execution, focus on market validation, focus on what their customers want from a value perspective is important. And most importantly for me, I always look out for what I term as the X factor, what really makes a person or entrepreneur different from very much the rest. And I can't really put that in words. Uh, it's more of like a feeling rather, uh, so called that's something that I can actually describe. Great. Does, does age matter to you? No, actually age, uh, <laughs> not, um, you realize that there are certain founders that um, I've worked with actually that uh, are a little bit more senior, but surprisingly, you should see some of the amount of experience and network and, uh, and that aspect is actually very important uh, in that specific area as well. So having that combination of so-called experience network go to market and having a unique idea of solving a specific gap in the market that probably is not being solved yet. I think that's a very much a good combination. Great. Nice. All right, Weiming, how about you? What do you look for in the founders? Yeah. I think what uh, we just talked about is essentially very critical. Uh, on top of it, uh, it's very important for whether you are young or whether you are a more senior entrepreneur, all right? It's all about uh, looking at uh, how you're able to look at problems. I think back to 101 is to create the value to your customer, to your employee, as well as to your shareholder, that what the problem. So we always uh, spot on the founding team needs to really keep looking at problems. Uh, and, and you know, the, all this evolution of technologies are changing how uh, solutions can be uh, formulated. And this is a continuous effort. So it doesn't mean that today you are the most cutting edge guy who came up with this solution called a product 
means that this is going to sit with you for, you know, forever. So that that uh, uh, adaptability has to be very, very disciplined. Always looking at how, when you're talking to your customer, is how to solve this problem in a bigger scale. So today you're a startup company, you solve the problem, their problem in this in this area. Tomorrow when you're on a, you know, more in a way advancing yourself into perhaps outside of Singapore, this could be the big problem, right? So that, that problem itself, the identification of the problem and coming out with already your formula of success, plus creating new uh, strategy, bringing people coming together and creating that solution in the big, bigger scale. The IP may not be yours, but you're able to lead the whole project and bring that whole solution set to the customer and create the value and help them to bring them to the level of seeing you as a trusted advisor. I think that is very critical to run a successful company. And this is the kind of recipe that we are looking at in a founding team, whether they are able to do just a Singapore market or Southeast Asian market, or if not the global market. That's how we measure them. Great. And I think through this whole process, right, identifying market leaders can invest in you know, like Tesla for electric vehicles, SpaceX even. So really interesting points, yeah? All right, Michelle, how about you? Mm, if uh, we're talking about the founders who pitch their business, um, personally, what I look out for are founders who know their numbers, so of their business and the market opportunity. So have they assessed the industries that they're in and if the industries are positioned for tremendous growth? And whether it's benefiting from the tailwind of the pandemic, I think this is extremely important for um, us also. And we also want to know like um, what's their fundraising grow, uh, goals and their growth strategies. I think one of the things that are very that's very another thing that's very important would be that there must be strong founders and the founding team must have the tenacity and resilience to make the dream happen. Very important at the early stage, and whether the company will three x by the next round that they are raising, maybe in the next um, twelve to eighteen months. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's important. Having that that plan in mind, uh, although most of the plans may not be the same. Uh, given the pandemic like this, something unpredictable. So, well, at least they've thought about it. I think that's important. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, if I may say sure. another point, which is very critical, I think uh, it's always what have they learned, uh, what lesson have they learned? Because we always ask question, uh, how are you so successful? But we also must ask them, how much failure have you gone through? What are the lessons that you have learned? And ask them to illustrate the lessons that they learned and we give them our, you know, uh, basically we share with them how people have overcome some of the lessons that they learned. So suddenly, we become, a, you know, a soul searching for them in terms of what they think that their weakest point, the weakest thing. We not just giving them the capital, but we also give them that direction. If not, also giving them the right connection for them to help reach the gap. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, uh, that part of the engagement process, working with the entrepreneur is very critical. Yeah, I think on, on all aspects, right, even not just on the business itself, but also on their mental wellness, about the team. Uh, and, and essentially, it's, it's, as, it's as though as, it's a, as a doctor administrating a patient <laughs> to some extent, I would say. Yeah. Um, right. So, so for, for the audience here today, um, if, if you have, uh, you know, some questions you have for the panelists, please do type in the questions in the chat below. Uh, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share the questions with the panelists uh, towards the end of this session. Yeah. So I've heard, you know, many of them, uh, the panelists about what they look for for founders. So now going more into what do each of these panelists do have uh, to offer as well, right? So Michelle, I uh, understand you're doing ecosystem development at Social Impact Catalyst, right? So how does an entrepreneur benefit from such an ecosystem? 
Thank you, Erin. So I think ecosystem is very important and ecosystem shortens the time for entrepreneurs to solve business problems and also learn mistakes from industry peers. So similar to what Mimi has mentioned, it actually help um, shorten the time um, for you to learn about a lot of things and like prevent making the same mistakes that all, maybe all entrepreneurs make. So I think ecosystem is important in that aspect. And another aspect is that you can share resources, networks, and tools that are very common in, in I think, I think uh, this industry or um, maybe like in the startup sector. And also I think with this support network, it will make the founder's journey not so lonely. And I, I believe that that's very important for, for founders. Great, yeah, important, yeah, true. The, the ecosystem support, uh, especially what SIC has uh, to, to, to offer to the to this ecosystem here for entrepreneurs, yeah. So, so adding on also to, to your experience at Quest Ventures, right? Given that it's a leading uh, early stage venture fund in Asia, you know, could you share more about this difference? Because I think some entrepreneurs will, will, will question, right? what's the difference between a VC and an angel, you know? You know what what does it mean to them you know, and also apart from capital what else have or your portfolio companies benefited from it mm, okay sure i think um the difference between angel investors and um vcs uh it's it's a primary fact that angels are wealthy individuals so like high net worth individuals who invest their own money into companies they might assemble themselves into like um angel networks and then do syndicated investments um for vcs we are employees of the venture capital firm so we invest other people's money um, into our portfolio companies so angels maybe take bigger risk and they take larger stakes in your startup so they might end up having a lot of control over your company for vc it is still risk capital but um there's there's a need for you to have a clear return for our investments so i think um with with that right we we'll want you to be successful you we want you to succeed and i think with that we'll provide you with all the knowledge and connections um that we have to ensure that you achieve um the kind of growth that um we set out to have yeah mm -hmm. and apart from capital i would say that quest ventures do provide our portfolio companies with um our quest family benefits so this helped them save costs like about usd seven hundred and seventy thousand. And then um, you would also have access to our mentors and founders networks to up to 200 experts and it's still growing. And you would also be able to build your startup alongside the Quest team, which um, do have various capacity building programs, such as the Vietnam Global Innovation, Scale Up Malaysia and Kazakhstan Digital Accelerator. Wow, awesome. And I think we have also, you know, Wei Ming and, and Hui Jie both also do angel investments apart from their fund themselves. I believe so, yeah? Yes, good. Cool, uh, and uh, we mean, right? So so you've heard from, uh, you know, about our experience, right? The extensive experience in, in, in your corporate MNCs you've been involved in. So actually, what, what actually made you interested to have a shift towards investments and fund management? Just curious. On that. Well, you know, um, uh, when uh, you are in the corporate world, after a while, you don't want to get retrenched. You want to reinvent yourself. Uh, uh, but that's, that's kidding. Uh, but what I think more important is that uh, uh, for me, I'm a continuous learning person. So um, I look at where I am today and I look at how to prepare my next, uh, uh, you know, the, the next juncture. And this is uh, important that to bring, how uh, am I able to bring the corporate know-how, the transformation in the business, as well as the fast pacing learning technology. So when I talk through all this, what I've been doing for almost uh, 15 years, I suddenly think that, in, can I just impart that knowledge to the young people? Uh, and I thought one day, perhaps my, if I were to come out to become a consultant myself, I cannot stick hold with them. The only way for me to stick hold and not just mentoring them, but working with them as partner is to invest. And that's why I've learned how to create that, uh, my reinvention path to stick home with them, to basically give them what I've known, not just what I've learned, but the connection, the connectivity in the market. 
yeah. uh, to them and uh, then put the money with them and also more important help them to fundraise to me so now suddenly i'm also one of the founding uh, member that i would raise more money and put that money into them you see so that helps them to focus laser focus on their market know-how how to bring customers how to retain the customers and organize how they can be more competitive and the other part of the business which is bringing money into and all these things perhaps i can i can do the work for them you see so i think that's the kind of leverage that people will look at that what i've learned and this is also what i will leverage them for my investors because i'm a fund manager so i will have a lot of investors coming in like uh, what michelle say we are dealing with not just our own money but the others right so uh, the accountability has to be there and that's why we will definitely bring the right quality of the deal that we invest in them plus getting them to invest in the yeah. fund that we run right right so, so it's really yeah the smart money coming in with experience in corporates and i also believe many of the companies at early stage they, they would struggle with sales right and then that connection could probably help them i believe so absolutely and one other thing's very important is that venture capitalists needs to learn what is regulatory framework right because when a singaporean company goes into indonesia goes into malaysia it's a different battleground and and not just the connection but you need to understand the regulatory framework so that they don't get themselves into trouble yes of course i think that's really crucial given that we're venturing the unknowns but has huge potential in southeast asia and i think also recently the indonesian government just changed their tax structure and how the business operation would be like that for certain correct. type of entities yeah. correct another point if i may just uh, because yeah. i think we've got entrepreneur also perhaps we also have some vcs here all right i think both vcs and entrepreneur must look themselves in the same team be it whether the vc put in 10 percent 30 percent it could be significantly min minority it doesn't matter okay what it matters here is to look at who's uh, brings that value to the table and and money itself is just one of the the more the, one of the ingredient but the more important is to organize yourself into the stakeholding strategy and then then vcs themselves needs to also know how to raise fund raise more money right and then to bring that resources back to the company that they have belief in that they are backing all right so it's not a one-time investing it's always continuously looking at what are the leverage for instance uh, for us we we have invested in venture capitalist fund so so we because we have invested in them okay and uh, you know we somehow then we share some portfolios insights and then if they have done something uh, because we invested in the us we invested in europe so some of those uh, things that and i sit in some of the uh, VCs, uh, private equity board as the advisor. So what we do here is that we bring some of the know-how and bring some of the resources back to Asia, and then uh, then that's how then they will be scaling into Series B, Series C, Series D, right? Plus, if today you are a very early stage company, that is also very critical because there's a lot of spin-off coming from A Star and whatever thing, right? So people are looking at the product level but we look at how to bring that market connectivity to them yeah so i think yeah. vc vc needs to be equipped in all this skill set so that you will have a very happy marriage at the end of the day yeah and that's very critical for young vcs to be in this industry it's a very very difficult industry very very tough but that's how you make yourself as a uh, it makes yourself a difference and entrepreneur themselves also young people needs to not only understand what is technology they need to understand what is money matters when you take money from people it is your your responsibility not to burn the money your responsibility is to build that value of the money that people has given you and you take this and show people that you are not just accountable 
but you're able to learn the experience and then become better. Yeah. So entrepreneur needs to learn that. Yeah, that's really wise word. I mean, I think growing that value itself and 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 having VCs to to have complementary support across the portfolio companies. And, and it's interesting to know that you've been so invested in funds of funds and, and really scaling the impact to a global level. And, and, you know, given, you know, I believe, you know, back then you, you your friends also in MNCs and you know, a corporate executive, do you also see more of your friends or, or, or corporate executives starting their own ventures? And if so, is yes. there any, are there any benefits or advantages to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like what Hui Jie has seen, a more senior entrepreneur we are also seeing more senior mentor that has uh, transformed themselves as a consultant you see before this whole innovation sector is taking off in singapore we are seeing a lot of very valuable champion okay very very valuable talented pool that they have they was they were actually managing director ceo of the asia pacific region so now the trend here that I've seen, and I've been always encouraging all these uh, ex-colleague of mine, is to also set up their own fund and learn how to invest and stakehold. I think at the end of the day, it's not about investment. It's the stakeholding into what you believe in that business that somebody is driving, not you now. Yeah. So that partnership needs to, needs to be scalable. And instead of they in the past giving a lot of consulting, a lot of training to uh, to the entrepreneur. Now we have seen the trend is for them to stick home more with them and uh, giving them the ammunition. And I think this is all good. And I hope that if a minister is still online, I would also uh, perhaps suggest to the minister is to really look at how to elevate this pool of Qian Pei into our back to our society instead of letting them not letting them uh, retire so early we need to repurpose them uh, with their talent with their market connectivity and some of the money they have they've got back into where our whole entire ecosystem and that will make singapore ecosystem a big difference because singapore ecosystem or rather singapore corporate hub has a lot of talent pool in regional management, regional market management, if not global management as well. So we need to bring these people back to uh, where, and we help them to stake hold back into the young entrepreneur and help them then scale up. Yeah, really, truly, fully agree with whatever you've said, um, Yu Ming. I think that the ecosystem uh, for, for the, the more experienced individuals in the corporate space to come back to empower these young entrepreneurs, right? And also potentially start their own funds to, to give back and also grow their investments, you know, uh, wealth preservation and legacy planning, etc. I think these are really useful tips and really encouraging for corporate executives. Correct. Thanks, Yu Ming. All right. And uh, last, we'll have like Hui Jie. Hui Jie, given that you have started off as an entrepreneur, right? What's the challenges you face when fundraising? That would be one question that I would also want to ask. <laughs> well, I guess the, when I first started, I really didn't know who to raise money from, right? So I just went around and raised from anybody I can find and anybody I can talk to. But then again, I would say that's one. You managed to speak to Wei Ming? I think he was. <laughs> well, no, we Ming for a while already, so. <laughs> So I, I guess the thing about entrepreneurs very importantly for, for fundraising is that they really need to know the investor's mandate. They need to know the investor's intention. And at the same time, they need to know the investor's value add. And these three is actually the most important things, uh, I think, from fundraising perspective. Because if you don't know the investor's mandate and you speak to a lot of them, technically you're wasting their time, you're also wasting your time. And if you do know their mandate, it's actually very much easier to communicate directly on the value proposition you have, uh, your so-called startup, as well as communicating to what they're actually looking for. The second part, other than investor mandate, it's really about looking very much at the intentions of the investors. Are they there to flip? Are they there to drive sustainable business? Are they looking for exit through a listing? And many a time that's very important to be aligned with the so-called founders. Otherwise, uh, as the startup do grow and hopefully it does grow, then there might be certain more tough discussions that both the founders and the investors will need to start to have. And that might take up a lot of mental toll, especially when you're already spending a lot of time. 
already on driving the business and making sure that cash flow positive and uh, running all the day-to-day -day items. And lastly, the more important thing is also the value add the investor bring forth. Because many a time, you're not just looking at capital that the investor can bring. If they have a specific value add in the domain or network or the go-to-market, opening up certain forms of markets or specific domain, uh, that's actually something that is super valuable because uh, it's not something sometimes that you want to find or spending money can easily be obtained. So I guess uh, if I had known this from when I first started from a fundraising uh, so-called state, uh, these three key things of uh, talking to investors or knowing first their mandate, intentions and value add will save me so much time and so much more mistakes uh, that I previously have actually uh, made before. Right. Wow, I would say it, it would be even be challenging to list out all the challenges in such a short one hour panel. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. And I hope, you know, we can invite you for the next panel uh, subsequently, you know, to, to share more. Right. And, and, you know, another question would be, you know, given your extensive entrepreneur experience, right, and business successes, you know, is it necessary to raise funds from VCs? And at what stage, when will you recommend the entrepreneurs to raise funds from VCs? I think I'll take this uh, very much from two different perspectives. Uh, it's very much the objective for the startup. Uh, depending on the business model, well, quite a number of businesses would probably need to raise uh, very much at the early stage to fund some of the developments. Whereas for certain business models, they can be almost cash flow positive, although rarely, but they can be almost cash flow positive uh, pretty much quickly. So it's very much important to weigh out what the founder value of that specific fundraise and what is the use of proceeds and eventually where that use of proceeds can bring him towards. So if his valuations at 10 million, he raised a million dollars and so called a million can bring him to the next stage where it'd be worth $30 million uh, based on his use of proceeds. Oh, by all means, because that actually makes sense. So it really depends on what the founder has um, as a key goal. Does he want to build the business uh, over a period of time? Does he actually wants to uh, so-called expedite, uh, so-called the growth? However, many a time, I think the bulk of the fundraise many comes many a time comes from the part on scaling a business. So there's always different stages where you want to first initially build the product uh, pre-revenue, then you want to do market validation, and eventually you want to scale. So founders should know roughly, you know, in the market there already are certain benchmarks. Um, in this specific area on what to do. And typically, of course, you want to raise a little bit more than what you actually plan. If your runways, uh, you're going to raise for about 12 months, make sure you raise for 15 to at least 18 months because uh, fundraising will not actually uh, be as quick as you think it might be. So I think this is from one uh, aspect. I think from the other aspect, I would say to a certain extent, you'll always be raising, but it's about how much you throttle it, right? So uh, although you might not be actively raising for a specific round, you will always want to meet up with potential investors, primarily because I think that raising funds is very much like building a relationship, right? Uh, it's not when you really like need it or you want the funds and then you go to a VC and they give it to you immediately. They want to know you, you want to know them. And eventually over time, you build a relationship. And even though you're not actively raising that part of time, you want to meet up them, give updates. And it's actually helpful because firstly, they get to know you better, they understand your progress, but at the same time, you actually get to get very valuable industry tips on what's happening in the market, considering they're seeing so many other different startups. So I would say to a certain extent, you'll always be raising and building the relationships with uh, the venture or the potential investors, primarily because um, you just want to, to make sure that uh, you have that close relationship at the point of time you want to trigger. The funny thing is uh, sometimes when you compete around, then uh, some of the investors will come and say, hey, do you have any more left, you know? Or, hey, you know, can you slot me into that final bid uh, so and so forth? So it's always good to catch up with them because uh, you never know. Sometimes uh, they might just uh, surprise you with uh, so-called a last-minute uh, decision to participate in that round. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Reed. Yeah, I think, like, let, you know, I have a question to go a little more technical. Uh, given that fundraising and all that may be necessary for certain kind of business that are capital-intensive, Right. Do you recommend you know, a bank loan or a convertible note from investors? Uh, that really depends. Um, this is a question that uh, it's really much, much more of an art as well as a science. Primarily because uh, it really depends on the structure of who you're raising it from 
Is it like a private equity? Is it a venture capital of the likes? They will typically have their own mandate on whether they prefer like a convertible or they rather do a debt structure of the likes. Of course, from a founder perspective, if you were to take certain loans and in fact, if you believe strongly in your startup that eventually that the equity will move all the loans and you can actually return the loans and you don't want to convert it, uh, well, it's the best of both worlds to a certain extent, right? For very much the startup founder. So it's really a conversation that um, I would say depending on the objective of the founder, but many a time it's also depending on objective and mandate of the investor as well. So although you might want it, but well, depends on the other side, it takes two hands to clap. So it really depends. And uh, some structures for that might be a little bit better than so-called equity. So you need to know what you're actually raising for. Is it for project financing or is it specifically really to fund and fuel the growth of the startup? So um, it's really many, many variables, I would say, uh, to answer that question. Great. Thanks, Etienne. And, you know, we do have a question from the audience, right? So Jonathan for us, we mean, you know, what are the learnings or failures you have for the company that went through? And I believe it would be your, your venture fund. Are there any learnings or challenges, failures that you went through? No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, the failure uh, has many forms. And depending how uh, much, what, what each angle are you emphasizing? Whether it's a financial failure or whether it's a organization failure or even an expectation failure, right? And uh, what, uh, as a venture capitalist, uh, when you look at the failure happening in your portfolio company, the first thing is not to look at the financial. Because the financial will not be the the underlying area, uh, underlying fault line that you look at. You really look at what is the fault line. And many of the times, what I've learned is always to do with people, to do with the founder, not about the market. <laughs> okay. So, number one, the three things that in the failure that where you need to look at where the fault line is. Number one, the fault line is that you know, are there any competitive competitor that has been targeting them, taking away some of their people? Okay. Poor people normally are the, the guys that, whether they are in the field, which is the, the sales side, or the back-end architect, okay? Not the founders. People will never take away the founders, right? So that's the two area. The third area, second area is very important to me. Has the founder already gone into his comfort zone so complacent that he lose his soul of fighting okay suddenly he got his series a two million dollars uh, he thought hey you know i'm just going to hire people when you are in the hiring spree bring a very good people suddenly the founders uh, you know, his performance gone down it's not the team gone down right so i think all these things the fault line where you need to is to sit down with them again okay and really talk straight with them to say that, you know, is this is the issue. We have to learn from the mistakes, but we need to create a contingency plan. If the contingency plan is the people, the core team has already been poached by their competitor, then I think uh, we really need to do some recovery. All right. The, the founders typically has to step in back and, you know, take up the job, take up this role until they found people okay so these are these are the uh, i think in terms of failure it's not about whether there's no failure there's always failure but how do you detect the failure how do you create a recovery plan and then how do you then ensure that the execution of the founding team is there as agreed in the recovery plan and move forward in life Great, great points. I can see why Wei Ming and Hui Jie are, you know, knowing each other for a long time. And I believe you support one another because of the values alike. And I think these are really good, um, you know, information you have shared to the founders here today, the entrepreneurs, or those who are thinking to start up. So I believe it's been really encouraging, right? And, and, and knowing that uh, our, our entrepreneurs here and our 
uh, senior corporate executives so willing to come back to help the ecosystem, uh, you know, develop Singapore's business ecosystem itself, and for us to go global from day one. Right. And, and all right. So, so I don't think we have any other questions from the audience. Um, and, and I'll probably just go on straight to wrap this up. Um, you know, really for all panelists here today, right? What would that one advice you want to give to founders who are fundraising? So maybe I should start with. Sure, go ahead. I don't fundraise. <laughs> what would you give to the found founders? Don't go, to, don't go to anyone and ask for money. Hmm. Go to everyone and make people believe in you. That's more important. Okay, don't go for don't go and ask for money. Says that yeah, a lot of people has been always concentrating the discussion point on, hey, you know, uh, I need two million, and this is the two million that what you know. I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, and and by the way, you know, my valuation is that that oh man, I think uh, you know, I think that's not uh, what you need to do. Uh, you have to give them a true report and account of what has been accomplished. Number one, right? That accomplish, accomplishment of the track record is important. Share with them that, you know, this is the recipe that I've created successfully. Now what I need next, and uh, basically, you know, invite them to work with you uh, to really look at how to tackle the issues and uh, the shortcoming, and therefore how this money can be there to bridge the gap. Okay, and second thing is that don't go to people when then you need money. As an entrepreneur, you need to be very resourceful. Okay, come to know us before even you need the money. All right, come to know us and come to educate us what have you been doing, how much difference can you make it, how much you can make a difference, and then just build the relationship okay and become friends you know and uh, i always go to which eh? which is i don't need money you know but we are still good friends and we share with each other how you know we can be successful right so when one day he said i need money we may i'm not going to see who is there that you know that just come to me for money because i know what he's doing right so i think that's the kind of relationship that every entrepreneur whether you are at the very early start or at the later stage you still need to have that kind of resource great really that's this also i think building relationship as humans ourselves right it's something that even ai can't replace because a human connection and of course it will be a lot better if we could have a physical session uh but by all means because of COVID, we could make do with a virtual session but hopefully you know, post COVID-19 or when uh, things get better, we could have uh, physical networking, right? For for great people like yourself, we may wait here, Michelle to come on board to share with our fellow founders. And we do have a question from Abdul, right? He asked, right, uh, is it, should we incorporate first or is it important to find a partner investor first? Maybe Hui Jie or, or, you know, would like to take the floor, given your entrepreneurial sharings and experience, yeah. Sorry, should we incorporate as an incorporate company first? Or? Yeah, I believe that was his, he meant, yeah. Or find an investor or... Partner first. <laughs> well, I guess uh, that's just an administrative uh, tool, but if you find an investor and you don't even have a company, I guess they might think you're not serious. <laughs> I guess you try to find a partner, you don't have a company probably, uh, you know, they might think you're not serious as well. Uh, I would, you know, it's just a basic, uh, in Singapore, you can do it in three hours or less than 24 hours. Uh, I always believe uh, no harm incorporating it and we can see how we can so-called settle the rest of it after that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fritia. And I think probably Wiming was one of the few who were in the fourth front line to help improve the governance and the efficiency of the government allowing businesses set up quickly, yeah? <laughs> Thanks, Weaving. Thank you for, for the hard work back then so that we can enjoy the benefits now. And, and, and Michelle, given that you are uh, from the Venture Capital Fund, uh, would you then you know, have some advice for Abdul? I think, I think with regards to incorporating first or raising first, it really depends who we are raising from. 
Yeah, and I would say that if you're um, in Singapore and you do, you're a Singaporean, maybe you want to consider um, getting your pre-seed money from the Startup SG Founder Grant. Yeah, so like um, within the first six months of your incorporation, um, you are actually eligible for this grant. So like before you incorporate or within six months, um, in, in terms of your incorporation. And then um, with uh, with an uh, registered entity, I would think that fundraising from your seed and uh, also Series A investors, that, that would be more possible. Yeah, because we definitely want to see like, um, uh, uh, I would say like a proof of value and also like that you're scaling and there's some traction. Yeah, and it's very hard to prove that if you don't have a, a company so, so Michelle, registered. given that you are yeah. taking the question, uh, you know, what, what would then your advice be for the founders who are fundraising through your fund? Right. Um, I think like in terms of that, I really uh, agree with both uh, women and Hui Jie. So like you have to do your research and know your investors even before you're raising, especially if you're raising from VCs, you need to, um, you can pitch to them even before and get feedback from investors point of view, like what they might be looking for. And also just as Hui Jie mentioned, right, it's good to know like their investment mandate, check sizes, and also like value add. So this will not this will not make the investor this will then make the investor pitch like more um productive and it will increase your success of going forward in terms of like the the process that every vc um do have and also echoing women in the earlier part of the panel a relationship with your vc is really long term so it's likened to be getting married you must make sure that you know you will be able to work with them to grow your company towards a common goal and we'll be able to work with them even as time gets hard and the goal changes and your company has to pivot. I think like um, during the COVID time, it was a very good stress test um, about like whether you're suitable for each other, the VC and the founders. So I think I think in terms of that, you need to maybe check even before you go into like um, this VC and, and startup um, um, relationship. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Hui Zian, and thanks, Viming, so much for your time today. Um, are there any last words from the panelists? Anything you want to say to the audience? Uh, maybe I should just uh, um, just say something that uh, is in my heart every day. Uh, we are in the pandemic, and um, everybody uh, felt very down in the beginning. But now, there's light in the tunnel. That uncertainty there is still there. Uh, whether you are today as a, already a very seasoned entrepreneur uh, and or you wanting to test what is entrepreneurship, uh, you need to do one thing. You need to really look at the pandemic and create something where you turn the pandemic into an opportunity. So whether you're a fintech company or your IoT company, it doesn't matter, right? Because the whole pandemic changes the whole world, right? Uh, and how you live, how you work, and uh, and therefore I think there's really a new way of doing things. And uh, please be optimistic and go around trying to understand from people, talk to more people. What is the impact? I think. At the end of the day, what we need to do after this pandemic war, there's only one key word that we want to take away. Impact. How can we create an impact? Okay? So we need to reflect ourselves and look at how to reposition ourselves. Where, if we were able to reposition ourselves, we know how to create new market for ourselves. And this is the opportunity. And that we that opportunity that we think in our mind set through we need to ask ourselves can this be an impact impact to singapore impact to the region impact to the world okay so that's important that everybody needs to keep thinking every day okay thanks yeah. Ming. that's really very encouraging and i think what you've mentioned is really true you know entrepreneurs at this time you know the stress test from COVID. And, and the relationship building is really the adversity quotient that, that entrepreneurs have within them. Uh, and then and then capitalize on that opportunity and, and grow a global business. Thank you, Wei Ming. Thank you, Hui Jie. Thank you, Michelle, for your time. Let us just take a group photo together. I'll give a count to three and then we could take a photo. Yeah. So please put on your brightest smile. <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, panelists, for your time and the audience. Uh, audience, do stay on. I will now share screen and then we'll find out who's the lucky winner. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you panelists. Bye. Thank you. See you.